You're listening to Mount Hermeneutics, where three Marines give their perspective on God, faith, and spirituality with a heavy lean on the Divine Council worldview. This is not your grandma's Sunday school, nor is it always for the Christian faint of heart. Nothing about who we are or what we say make us experts. But you better believe we'll have a take, and perhaps it won't suck. Dude, I was playing devil's advocate with you. I don't believe in other gods. I'm all Yahweh. So Matt's wrong. It 100%. I sound like a self-important jackass. Hey, I'm Brian. Welcome to the Mount Hermeneutics podcast. All right. So uh, this is Matt. Uh, hopefully you guys enjoy the show. And this is Andre. And uh, yeah, let's get into it, man. Right let's on. Go. All right. What are we talking about? We could talk about a couple of different things. Um, I, I think we've closed out you know, what we talked about last week. So definitely don't want to do any of that again for now. I have um, so many points to follow up. I'm with, sure though. you do. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Me, me too. And so, <laughs> right. In, in we, fact, we, we could, we could circle them, right. As we can, sure. as we, yeah. as we orbit the world and, and keep I, doing I, the show. I may make jokes and allude to a couple of points because that's just my style. So, well, that's, I mean, then I'm going to have to answer them and then we're going to be on it. And it can turn into the Fox so. uh, presidential GOP debate. I didn't watch it. Okay. Andre, you mentioned Brian. Brian, you get 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they did it. It was anybody who, if you made a, took a shot at somebody, they got 30 seconds to respond to the shot you took. And, and you had the former vice president. He he took a shot at me. You're yeah. Like, and they were like, the that, was at me. that was at me. That, that was at me. That was at me. Let me talk. <laughs> and they don't even actually respond to that. They just have something else canned in their pocket that they right. like, oh, what a mess. What a stupid format. They need to, they need to mute their mics. When they go over and they make the little buzzer noise, their mic should no, they go need, off. They need to ditch that whole format. I mean, answer. You get a question and you get to talk. Well, that's not debating, right? That's just answering right. questions. It was just letting them all have a say yeah. for a minute. Yeah. Well, they they should say here's I, the, here's the topic. Go. So Brian, the one the <laughs> so, one weird part is like they're asking like policy questions and this and that, and then yeah. out of the blue, this chick goes, "So, uh, Governor Christie." Uh, the American people are really interested in the possible existence of UFOs. If you become president, and he goes, are you freaking kidding me? He's like, you're giving me a <laughs> UFO question? His face is, <laughs> that's the only time I actually liked Chris Christie. Yeah, he showed that like whole real thing. personality, right? Like, oh, of, co- of course. And he made like a New Jersey joke, because I guess Martha McCallum's from New Jersey as well. So that, that was a cute moment. Mm. <laughs> I'm trying, U- I miss UFO, it. really? UFO. You're gonna ask. I don't know why it was talking about anything else. It was the it was the last segment before they had their closing remarks. I don't mean that. So so speaking of UFOs, kind of sort of speaking of UFOs, do you guys see that Elon Musk's net worth went up seventy one billion dollars? Hmm. What is it now? I I don't know. A lot. Up. It's north of seventy one billion. It's bigger than seventy one billion. Is he the richest man in the world again? Yeah. Based on ever. Well, because like, so apparently like SpaceX is why I brought, I made that connection to the UFOs, but yeah, apparently SpaceX signed some stock deal and they got 140 billion of of money infused and because he owns 51%, you know, whatever. He's at 219 billion. That's so crazy. And people don't understand why he doesn't care about their opinions of how he runs Twitter. (laughs) Yeah. I'll never respect him until he fights Mike Zuckerberg. Uh, just not going to respect until he does that yeah uh, i'm sure he'll lose a lot of sleep over your lack of respect (laughs) we got 219 billion you can just you can just buy respect i mean i mean what what's what is 219 billion dollars for if not to buy respect i I mean you could do a whole lot of things on top you know not and not worry about that Uh, i i saw a meme My, my son actually showed it to me while we were at the game last night and it was like would you rather have 30 million loyal friends or $10 million? And it was an interesting, so we sat here and had this like, you know, philosophical discussion. And, I, and I'd already seen a video where this guy explained why the answer is what the answer is. Because my son's like, well, of course I take the money, right? Who wants 30 million friends? I was like, but if they're all loyal friends, you could ask each of them to give you $5. And if 30 million people gave you $5 or, or a nickel, 
<laughs> well, but I mean, five bucks, What's right? Five yeah. bucks for a friend. If a buddy says, Oh, right. can I get five bucks. You're like, here, I got $5. Right. So if you had 30 million people hand you a $5 bill, you got a lot of $5 bills. So you, you can't buy a 30 million person network. Well, there's that anything, too. right? No like, matter what you want to do. Yeah. Right. And really what you're doing with money is buying people's labor. Mm -hmm. So, if, yeah. So if you got 30 million people willing to, to do something for you, right um no oh, I, I like i said the, the, you're george bailey at the end of its wonderful life i'm never Plus one to say love. i need more go ahead what the love portion of it and uh, you have love. 30 million people loving you 30 million sounds awful touchy feely you make it you make it sound weird when you <laughs> when you put it like that he did that on purpose i'm quite sure with his mm. angelic voice it's love <laughs> It's love. Don't you want love? That's that's how Michael Jackson talks, and this is his. No, 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 you can't do that because I and I say this with love. L O V E love. No, you don't come in. You let that simmer. You let that simmer. You don't just start on your guitar. What's wrong with you? You're being <laughs> ignorant. You're being ignorant. <laughs> but yeah, so we got even weirder because we you added uh, Michael Jackson. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, what are you guys? Uh, what are you guys reading in your Bibles lately? I haven't read Bible directly. I've been doing more of the Bible ancillary stuff. I came mm, across center. a weird thing. Yeah, right. Um, I came across something really strange that I thought I'd throw out here as a as a wild card just to get a conversation going. Not that we want to spend a lot of time on it, but this this guy posited the theory that there is very little to no historical evidence of the existence of Abraham as a human being. And that the story of Abraham was allegorical, not literal. I found that's that pretty, to be interesting. Well, I mean, that's that's basic minimalist. Like the, the standard thinking in Old Testament scholarship um, among critical scholars is minimalism. Like it's 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 a it's unhistorical unless like they discover smoking guns mm -hmm. that that proves that it's historical. But uh it's it's kind of it's more of a philosophical disposition that uh and it's true that there there isn't a lot of evidence um but there's and there's not a lot of evidence for anything from that period i mean if this was before herodotus and right polybius and before history was developed as a discipline right and so it's it's kind of what you expect but uh i was watching something the other day i think it was one of those pints with aquinas short videos where they're talking to a, mm -hmm. a Bible scholar and he talked about how the, uh, like all the, the, the Dan Staley, it's a, uh, something they discovered. I think it was in the early two thousands about, uh, there it's, I'm kind of butchering it. Cause I don't, I didn't, I didn't remember the details. It mentions the house of David and it's set like a, it, it's dated to a couple centuries after the time of David but that somebody is bragging okay. about their victory over, over the house of David, which of course, you know, they, they didn't, they didn't typically name their dynasties after fictional characters. Like there might be a, they, they might have, they might attribute legends to the founders of their dynasties, but they still regarded them as historical people. Like mm -hmm. a, they, they weren't going to like, it, it's, it's pretty compelling evidence that David was a real guy, which I know you brought up Abraham, but, uh, yeah, most of the things that I've seen is that was always against against David because he was the the closest, and it was a whole kingdom. Because he was, was a king, which is different right. than just some so dude then, who had so kids. A, yeah. a lot of skeptics were just let, that never existed. And I think I saw the same. I don't know if you saw it in an article format or if you were watching a video. But a video. I, I did. I did see an article. Uh, what Brian's talking about in the, the House of David. Man. Yeah, the the thing I was watching started with the point of view that. Abraham, you know, might not have existed as a real person, but then it took this wild ass left turn and it started explaining that there was shadows or echoes of Abraham in Rome. And I, I, I don't remember the specifics of the video because it got so weird, but it was basically like, no, Greece, I'm sorry, Greece, not Rome. And it was using the, it was explaining how the i forgot the term now but the 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 person that 
kind of in Greek, in the Greek um, military that kind of pushed out and took over city states and established new areas and whatnot. There was all of these illusions and things that I, I'd have to find the video and, and I was listening to it in the background while I was working. So I admittedly wasn't paying a lot of attention to it, but it was, it was weird. But that's that's what my YouTube channel. If you guys ever saw my YouTube uh, recommendations, they're so weird. And <laughs> Mine are getting weirded by the weirder by the moment, right? Yeah. Mm. Well, because it's all, I, yeah. My, mine's intertwined with, uh, you know, the, was was Cain the first child of the devil? And then my next my my next video was like the Dodgers traded for. Yeah. <laughs> like, that's what. My mine are like you know how to build a guitar under four hundred dollars, and then the next one's you know did Abraham really exist? And then it's you know it's it's all over the place. It's really weird. Yeah, I'm like that. I've been in my uh, Western occultism rabbit hole, and that's probably Ooh. messing up my uh, your algorithms getting all kinds algorithms. of twisted. Yeah, <laughs> you're gonna get some spicy straight. stuff getting uh, demonic. Is what this is. <laughs> yeah, you guys. <laughs> In our chat, somebody shared that that one video from the that '80s sitcom about the kid who had AIDS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I, it was so me. I watched that. Yeah. Now, Mr. Now, Belvedere. Now YouTube thinks I'm obsessed with '80s AIDS propaganda. <laughs> <and> <laughs> I, just, I just found it so weird, like because there's a studio audience that's like applauding and laugh laughing. Track. I got at AIDS. A, at a, <laughs> at a little kid's like, "Hey, so how are you doing today, Timmy?" He's like, "You know, other than the fact I have AIDS." <laughs> except like, that was what? probably a program laugh track so the the producers were like oh that'll get some laughs and then they're telling you to to laugh at that and so they're programming this sense of humor into people I, I, there's like, no telling i'd love to know the, the yeah. truth it, it's not my fault i have aids well it's not my fault either <laughs> it's like wow <laughs> it, oof. yeah because yeah, the kid was like sneaking in the back door or something yeah they, they didn't want him to know he's coming to their house or something okay. and it, which you know at that time was it was pretty scary. I was super I scared just... of AIDS in the eighties. Well, because they made us. It was all the propaganda. Yeah. Right. Between the schools, we're like, can you get AIDS from a toilet seat if another kid has AIDS and he sits down and goes in the bathroom and then you do? <laughs> can you get it? And then that was juxtaposed on the one side, and then the other side was all of the crazy fundamentalists were saying that AIDS was the this was the, you know, the, the, the actuality of revelation coming true. And this was, you know, the world was going to burn <laughs> because it burns when right. you pee, when you have AIDS or something. Like, I remember like this really <laughs> vivid stuff coming out from the, from stuff like, I'm, I don't remember that, but I, I am do. glad I was not raised in church. Oh, during believe that me. era. Cause the, 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 the Southern Baptist were, were crazy with that, that this was God's hand and it was, and then it was, I, man, there was so much because it was, it was so wrapped up in, you know, it being, <clears throat> being a, a gay disease so that that was, you know, it's, it's a curse, it's a pox. And then there was that whole theory about the green monkeys in Africa and well, so now it's racist, right? It was you racist know? and it right. was tied to the, you know, the, the, the tribe of, you know, the descendants of Cain and like, there was so right. much going on in the eighties right. with, with it, all of this it was wild and then it, you know it wasn't like we didn't we had the was it ring. ham that was cursed that, that saw his dad noah naked was, was it ham okay. yeah, was yeah. Ham. yeah 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 it, and his other brother's like what you saw our dad naked let's let's cover him up walking backwards <laughs> so I was like wait what yeah. but, but you know it's funny because you know ryan white who was like the first child non-gay to to be prominently featured having having this disease and actually died before he graduated high school he got it from blood transfusion Mm -hmm. so so this was like 1985 uh my mom had been in the jehovah's witnesses for a couple of years by then so from 1982 and i think she got baptized in 83 or 84 but 85 comes out and you know the j-dubs are all about no blood transfusions so it's like, see, there it is. That mm. that's why we don't do so it. They so were, they were just yeah, as bad they were as all the whole <laughs> apocalyptic thing going on uh, with the blood transfusions. So basically, uh, in in uh, in the Kingdom Hall, we don't call it church. They, you know, they they preached, uh, don't do gay stuff, don't do blood transfusions, and kids don't do drugs, and you don't have to worry <laughs> about AIDS. 
<laughs> so as long as you don't the, stick the needles three. in your arms. Yeah, the big three. <laughs> Butt sex, needles, and blood transfusions, and which needles. is just needles. Like I, don't you know, put things so. in your body. Yeah, That's don't stab yourself. And then they were like, you know, threatens, you know, hey, don't get a tattoo right now unless you know they're using a completely different needle and yeah. and all, all that's probably good practice anyway on on just a, the disease front that's not deadly hepatitis and all the other yeah, things yeah stuff that just yeah. makes you feel bad in, in martial <laughs> arts we were we were taught like we trained to punch like in the philtrum but then but there was always advice like but don't do it because you'll get AIDS. <laughs> <laughs> don't bust that dude's face open because you can get AIDS. Well, yeah, because if you, you'll cut uh, your knuckles up on his hand, yeah, and on and his then, mouth, yeah. And so you got to kind of weigh, like, do I do I want to get beat up right now? Am I going to um, fight? Is this worth getting AIDS? Do I want to win this fight and get AIDS, or do I want just want to get beat up? And so, uh, you know, we worked on our kicks and our, our grapples. In, in, in that, no grapples. reason to punch a guy in the face. You can and grapples. Grapples can, what leads to that to that gayness. So I think maybe <laughs> I learned that from Diamond Dallas Page. Right. Yeah, I don't do that. He said, I don't do that Roman Greco gay stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pro wrestler. <laughs> but, Terry Funk but, died. But now oh, I know that oh, rest peace, mm. big fella. Wrestlers always die, man. They yeah, die so oh, young. I, well, oh, the roids. I, I watch Dark Side of the Ring, and it's like four seasons of the most depressing stuff you'll ever see in your <laughs> life. And I'm like, why do I watch this? I have this weird, guilty pleasure from it. And most of it's nostalgic childhood. I'm like, I remember that guy. What right. do you mean he's dead? Junkyard Dog is dead? No. So, you know, I'm like, wow. Uh, oof. Brian, you, well, didn't watch it. you didn't watch wrestling at all, did you? I watched uh, Hulk Hogan Rock and Wrestling on Saturday morning, and that's about as far. And I watched Rocky Three. That's about as far into wrestling as I got. <laughs> Thunderlips in the flesh, baby. The ultimate man <laughs> and the ultimate meatball. <laughs> How yeah. much do you think he eats? Weighing in a hundred, two hundred and two pounds. <laughs> about two hundred and twenty, two hundred two pounds. <laughs> okay, so, all right. So here's a here's a pop culture com- current thing. So you guys have seen this stuff with Trump, right? So it's Trump had to take, take the mug shot and self attested to his weight. Have you guys seen how much, how crazy everybody's going over that? Uh-huh. It'd be, well, one it's BS. So he self attested his weight whenever, apparently when you're booked in, in Georgia, you can just tell them how much you, what your height and weight is. And they just write it down. They don't really care. So he said he was six, six, three, two, six, 15. three, two, 15. And no, the, inter- the internet's going crazy because they're like, he's fat, blah, blah, blah. Does this look like, and they're showing pictures of like his, his rear in like a golf swing kind of deal yeah. from when he was president. And he's talked about the fact that he's lost a bunch of weight since the presidency. And, uh, and he does look thinner to my eye. His face and looks thinner. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And when um, you get old, you start losing weight anyway. And, and he's been going through a lot of stress, yeah. you know, and, and, and whatnot. So, I mean, it's entirely possible. I don't really care one way or the other. What I found interesting was the the hypocrisy that, you know, all of the anti-Trump people are largely leftists who are all that, you know, anti-body shaming people. You know, you can't talk about, uh, you know, Lizzo. She's gorgeous. She looks perfect. But Trump, oh, he can't be two fifteen. You know, I just, I just find the juxtaposition really, really, really funny, right? The, the fact that, you know, uh, you're not allowed to make fun of overweight people. You have to call them high calorie humans, right? But, uh, but, but Trump couldn't possibly be two. Is that two fifteen? No, and it's not two fifteen. Like somebody posted a picture of Chris Hemsworth. This is what six three two fifteen looks like. I'm like. He doesn't yeah, weigh you're 15 on, either. If, if you're on juice and right. you're and you're working out all the time for he, a movie, he role. might have weighed 215 in the uh the first in that Thor. Netflix that that Netflix show, but in Thor, he did not. It was actually so it actually was it was the uh the huntsman was the picture they posted. And he was oh, a lot yeah. thinner. He Maybe. was a lot thinner Maybe. than that. Yeah. Hmm. But anyway, I, I thought I've, that was interesting. I haven't seen 215 in a minute. It's probably 10 years since I've seen 215. Speaking of, since we started this podcast, I have lost 15 pounds. Have you really? Good for you. Cool. Yeah. So Congrats. I'm down to 255. <laughs> <laughs> I remember I, think when... I was about I was about 260 at your uh, at your graduation. I'm about 205 now. You've lost that, but you you were that heavy then? 
Oh yeah. I was a, wow. I was a chubby. Yeah. Just look at the pictures. I'm, I'm a big old fat guy. I mean, I look at those pictures and I'm like, who's that? Who's that fat guy who was with us? I don't remember. <laughs> I don't remember that guy. I didn't see him there, but, uh, but yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, uh, lost about 60 pounds. Good for you. Thanks. Right. It was, yeah. uh, it was my, uh, well, um, that's maybe, and it's maybe a topic for another podcast, but it was, well, we're, a, we're just kind of, we're kind of waxing, uh, <clears throat> we're kind of open form right now. Well, I was writing that blog article about, uh, the, what the church is missing and, uh, which is this, which doesn't narrow it down. I realized, cause that's all of my blog articles are about that, but it was, it was, it was actually the one where I was talking about the divine, the, uh, divine council worldview. And I was tying it into how we get the divine nature. And how the Christian life is a matter of participating in the divine nature, making every effort to add to your faith, excellence, knowledge, self mastery, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness. So, I was, so I'm kind of, I'm kind of writing this manifesto and realizing that I'm, you know, I'm I'm morbidly obese and probably drinking too much while I'm doing it, and realizing what a giant hypocrite I was, and so just kind of you know I prayed about it and was convicted by it, and I just. Uh, just didn't have the urge to to drink anymore and eat bad and lost it. But uh, That's what's up? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm I'm kind of the opposite. I I struggle to to hold any weight of 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 substance. When I finally cracked the code on how to gain weight, um, I couldn't get over 200 pounds, and I'm five eleven, and I'm you know lifting as heavy as I can and eating what I thought was as much as I could. <laughs> and, uh, and I finally just cracked the code and I started gaining weight and I got over 200 pounds and I was like, sweet. And I'm lifting heavier and eating more food, 205, 210, 212. And I was like, ceasefire. <laughs> like, I just, I, this, this feels like a roller coaster that I might not be able to, you know, slow down on the other side. So I, that was my heaviest I've ever been in my life so far as 212. And then, uh, I was, I was about 208, 209 when I broke my leg. And, mm. uh, and I, you know, my weight fell off like crazy. Cause one, cause my left, my right leg shrunk. <laughs> so I lost just in my one leg, I lost probably, you know, 15 pounds, but, uh, I roll like 195 now. Like I, and I haven't made a decision. Like I haven't like tried to turn the dial to put the weight back on. And I figure 195, 200 is probably like a slim, healthy weight for me anyway. You know, it's, my heart probably appreciates not being 250 kind of thing yeah. um you know maybe i won't have strokes <laughs> maybe, maybe not <laughs> you, know? You, you know it's it's crazy because right after the the month that i spent in the hospital i lost 30 pounds immediately right well just from not and lifting then, and not eating yeah just not eating just being sedimentary mm -hmm. and, and it, it's weird how all the times in my life when i just kind of pause and stop i lose a bunch of weight but then it gains really quick. Like when I tore my ACL, I was on, you know, convalescent leave for 30 days and I, I lost 30 pounds in 30 days. And then I, I put the 30 pounds back on, but I didn't look as good mm -hmm. as this be the prior time that I had the 30 pounds. Yeah. So it, that just, it just keeps happening to me. And then I haven't, I haven't been able to catch up with it since, since then. So now I finally, I'm moving, I'm able to walk longer distances you know, I can't really do cardio per se, but you know, I'm, you know, I can walk my dog. So a few yeah. miles, like I keep a little step tracker now and try to try to get those in every day. Yeah. I think my only saving grace when I broke my leg was that I had really good upper body strength. So having to be on crutches wasn't entirely challenging. Like I can't imagine like some like 65 year old woman that's like never worked out or whatever, and then have to exist on crutches. Like, wow, that's probably yeah, say pretty hard. That when you get to that age and you fall, that your your death day is within a within a year, right? Like that's it. You fall, yeah. you break your hip, you break yeah. your femur, yeah. like it, it, it's over. And that's because you, you're because you're now you're now you're stuck in a thing and you just can't do stuff. Yeah, I'm that's never going to be in that position, I'm dude. Gonna... I, I I went real hard in the gym the other day. They said Saturday, so Thursday, Thursday night. I went real hard in the gym back workout. Me and Austin lifted. And, uh, and I came in, dude, I could not recover. Like I, I'd gotten really hot lifting and I was like kind of that like pre puke kind of feeling. Mm -hmm. And like, it just didn't go away all night. And I looked at Carrie and I'm like, man, I don't know if I went too hard. I got too hot or I'm just getting old. 
And I was like, probably, yes. a, com- probably a combination of all three. <laughs> yeah. And I yeah. was like, man, this is bullshit. I don't like this. And she was like, honey, I don't think we have a choice in getting old. I was like, well, we have a choice. It's just frowned upon. Like <laughs> <laughs> she, probably, I bet she shot you the look. But <laughs> Was it Socrates um, or Aristotle or Plato? Who was it that made the comment about human, the man, man should, it's his responsibility to press the limit of his, one of them had a, had a, had a thing on working out. Um, pro- probably Aristotle. I, I, I don't think I all don't of that, that is, is why I don't do home workouts. Um, part half of my motivation is actually getting to the gym. That's and fair. Once and once I get there, you know, I'm already here. Especially when I was driving, you know, 20 minutes to get to the gym. Like, you know, I start sipping on my pre as I'm driving. By the time I get there, it's kicked in. You know, I I start seeing the people that I'm familiar with. I see my like my other family, right? Uh, all your bros. Start- yeah, you know, the, <laughs> all like the hundreds of my best friends. I don't even know their name because I've never talked to right? them. The... And, and it's funny because you you see him at like Trader Joe's, or whatever. And I'm like, hey, what's up? What's up? My wife's like, who is that? I'm like, and you're like, oh, I don't know. He's big. As shit. I don't even. I actually he's, don't know his name. He's strong as hell. Like <laughs> he's just he's he's this dude. <laughs> and you know we dap each other up or whatever, and like you know, we move on to the next thing. You know, in Costco, but <laughs> like that's funny. So half 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 of it is just is just getting there. And, and to me, once once I get there, then and even if I don't feel well, and and I had to do this during my recovery because I bet. I bet I had to go, but I wasn't me anymore, right? So I mean, when when I went down, I was repping four oh five and bench, like that was my workout, and now I'm I can't do the bar, <laughs> now now I'm I'm bench pressing a PVC pipe, right? So. So that 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 was the first like mental hurdle is that, hey, I'm still me, I'm just not manifesting as me today, <laughs> right? Mm-hmm. Or or for the foreseeable future, maybe never. Yeah. So I had to like had to had to come up with a new, you know, not really a new persona, but just the way other people see because people see you and meet you and see you in different capacities, and and you're you're no longer you to them. So it was, it was a, it was a tough thing because even, even my wife, like, right. Hey, I want you to pick this thing up or go and you're go like, grab this thing. Or, or, what part of having had a stroke. Do you not right. understand? So, and, and she's like, well, you're going to recover like in six months. I know you are because you're you. So we're going to have this thing and you're going to be back to driving and lifting things and screwing my light bulbs in and doing this stuff. All the things. Right. You know, was, that the, but, was that the Adrian Rocky speech she gave you? <laughs> yeah <laughs> which one three or four well it's either way it's always yeah. that's always the the turning point is yeah wh- he's, what i what i need is the is the rocky two when she wakes up and she's like win <laughs> so, and the music <laughs> starts going what I get, are we I waiting for i got <laughs> so, i got goosebumps just now just thinking about that <laughs> people shit on rocky two but i like it man that's by, I don't, by, by the way one is it, awesome it, except for five before we go down too far down that rabbit hole, it was Socrates, the quote that I was oh, thinking nice. of. It was, and the quote was, no citizen has a right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. What a disgrace it is for a man to grow old without ever seeing the beauty and strength of which his body is capable. Awesome. Oh, I'm in. I, I'm 100%. That Socrates is my guy. My right. guy is Socrates. Right? <laughs> you know, that... obviously we have an obesity epidemic in our culture. Um, it's not merely physical. It's, we have an intellectual and spiritual obesity problem as well. Like we think of, uh, and that, that quote is so antithetical to where we are as a culture. And, uh, you know, and I, I don't, I don't say this as if I'm in any better position. I was, you know, more, a morbidly obese alcoholic, not too long ago, but now you're just, just an alcoholic, not an alcoholic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I still drink. I'm, I have a drink right now, but I, you know, I'm not, uh, I don't down a liter of whiskey a night. Like I was, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. That's for the kids at home leader? about, yeah, not, it wasn't every night, but I could put down a liter of whiskey in a night and go to work the next day. Um, my, I mean, my sacco I could, training is going off. I, I could, <laughs> and I have, but I'm miserable for like three days in a row. If I do that. Yeah. I don't have, I don't, I didn't have a good day when I did it. Right. And it was always like, I'm never going to drink again. Then I drink again. But, uh, (laughs) 
but um, that was, it was, I honestly, I think I was the recipient of, of a miracle. Like when I was, when I was digging into that stuff and praying about it and writing about it, um, I would, I would, I'd pour myself a drink and then I'd just be watching TV or playing video games or something. And, and a few hours later think, hey, I could go for a drink. Oh, there's that drink I poured right there. Like I just didn't have the urge to drink it. Hmm. And, and uh, whereas before it was, I would, I'd pour myself a drink and drink it and think, wow, that's, that's pretty good and refill it. And before I knew it, I was down a bottle and it's time to go to work, but uh, which is a, a, a pathetic way to waste a life. And that's what I was doing. But, uh, but now I just first for when I was convicted of that and I realized that, uh, you know, how out of you know un, unbecoming that was for a a follower of jesus christ not just the alcoholism but the but just the the eating and the lack just the just the overall mentality of self-indulgence um i just kind of lost the urge to do it i had the let's just well, i had a i had a change in consciousness and my body no longer matched what i was inside and so hmm. uh and I think that's what the the Christian life is supposed to be. But we have such a, you know, that this, our, our, our overall culture of that leads to physical obesity. We have the same obesity when it comes to our intellectual and spiritual life. Like we have more, yeah. I, we have more information available to us than at any other time in history, but people are dumber than ever. They don't know basic things about their own, their own country's history. Yeah. Um, that's like that, like that video we, sh we watched, we shared in our group about, uh, where Neil, Neil, good old Neil was <laughs> talking drinking, about, buddy. was talking about flat earthers, right? He was saying yeah. how, you know, it's a, the fact that there's more flat earthers now is two things. One, it's a, it's a, it's a great statement to, uh, free speech and it's an indictment on our education system, right? Cause on one hand, it's cool that people are allowed to have stupid ideas and push them. But on the other hand, it's really unfortunate that people are this ignorantly, you know, existent that they could buy off on such bad science and believe it to be science. Well, we just have these bad habits because with that much information at your fingertips, do you really need to know anything? Like you never, you're never forced to actually read or 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 know something. And the same thing with just the social interaction of of, of persons. Right but now, you you swipe left or swipe right, and you and you have an expectation that if you do possibly meet where where things will go, and and no one really knows how to talk to anybody in person. I was just talking to some young people, and like I don't even I, don't, I mean, where do you meet somebody? I'm like I don't know. Where do you go? What do you what do you do? Where do you hang out? And I'm like well, mm -hmm. I I don't. Like well, there's your problem. Right. Right. We you know I describe my childhood or even my teens to my children and my my son straight up like. It sounds like you had way more fun than me. And I was like, because <laughs> I did, you know. And it wasn't about the debauchery. It was, the, it was the about, it was about the just going out and doing things. I mean, right? remember yeah. like living on our bicycles. Like, yes, you, when you get out of school, you your bike was like your ticket to freedom, right? And you would right. just ride around, and you and your buddies were like a little roving bike gang. I mean, <laughs> yes, yeah. it's, it's funny because people don't realize when they watch like like a series like uh, Stranger Things, mm -hmm. like that's literally that was, a, that was a thing three that of us that was our childhood like that was our yeah. childhood era the 80s yeah. right we, we were we yeah. were in grade school junior high in the 80s um but the way those kids just got on their bikes and just rode the hell all around that county like they yes. were at, they were in some like you know open mining facility one minute next <laughs> minute they're running down a hill next minute they're zooming past the police station right like it's like you do all those things there was a ton of construction where i grew up all the it was like a housing market boom mm -hmm. so we were in a in a new housing tract and then all the kids would ride over to the new housing tract being built and i'll tell you some foundations for housing makes hell of a bike ramp so we, we were just launching off of those things people were like hey get out of there kids we're like no we, <laughs> so used to, we, we used we, to pillage the uh the, the wood and the supplies to make uh half pipes and Yep. Yeah, for sure. Quarter pipes and yep. And you and you and your buddies would lay on the ground for your other buddies to jump over to see who how many people you could clear. Yeah, that was you know, the kind of thing we not did. really yeah. thinking that the only way for this to fail is when you land on a person, right? We had so much hubris <laughs> that we were gonna make the jump, so it didn't matter. Always, 
Like, why would I not make this jump? I wouldn't have you lay there if I didn't think I could do it. And you're like, dude, this is my bro. He could totally make this jump. Uh, (laughs) I I, I moved around a lot. So I was always the new kid. So I never trusted anybody enough to, Uh, to, to be a, 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 uh, a stunt hostage. So I'm, uh, we've been doing last couple of days, the new star Wars series came out of Soka. Mm-hmm. which sounds kind of silly or whatever, but it's it's actually kind of been a lot of fun with me and Austin. He's huge into the Star Wars stuff. Like, so he begged me and begged me and we watched, he got me to watch all the Clone, Clone Wars uh, and, and Rebels series. Arguably. And then we just finished Rebels and like we powered through Rebels. I mean, we just finished it two days ago. Mm. So we could watch episode one of Ahsoka yesterday. And I don't know if you, <laughs> have you watched them all? I, have, I, I I'm familiar with Briar went through a little phase when we first moved back here in like 2013, where she watched all, yeah. all the uh, so, so Rebels, Clone Wars and Rebels. Rebels literally is the prequel to the Ahsoka series. So all yes. of the characters in yeah. it are the, the Rebels. Oh, characters. interesting. Okay. So, I mean, literally like it ends and then Ahsoka picks up and it's like it, they're and they're pulling that cast back together only in live action. Huh. And so it was it was kind of cool that we powered through it. Um and then he watches and reads all the extra stuff on the side. So like, you know, he's like, well, dad, you know that blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, hold on. Was I supposed to have gleaned that from watching the show or is this from your extra readings? He's like, eh, okay. It was from extra readings that I've done. This is your Star Wars exegesis. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. What does he think about the, uh, the sequels? Um, well, we've talked about this. You and I have talked about this, Brian. He, he likes them simply because it's what he grew up on. So the old the, the 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 original trilogy to him is like the old stuff. It's like black and white Star Wars, as far as he's concerned. It's so sad. I mean, he has the same opinions that everybody has. Nobody likes Episode One, right? He he actually shares my view of the final sequence in three being you know maybe the most important. His favorite of all of them is uh, Rebel One, Rogue One, a uh, Rogue One. I'm sorry, yeah. Those aren't those aren't the sequels. Those are the prequels. The prequels. Oh, so the sequel sequels. Oh, he doesn't. Yeah. He doesn't. He you've, doesn't love them. Sorry, you've I, told I, me what you think of the sequels. Yeah, but yeah. I don't think you've ever talked about. So what you're Austin talking about thinks. episode seven, eight, nine, right? Oh, yeah. No, he doesn't. He doesn't love them. But again, it, it's his. It's relevant to him because that's like <clears throat> his like junior high, high school life, yeah. right? So he he doesn't hate them. He sees he sees the the yuck in them, um, but at the same time, it's just it's fresh content for him. And so he's mm. he he's happier to have content than to not have content, even if it's bad content. He's not a fan of Kathleen Kennedy and all of that. He's a big Dave Filoni guy. So he loves Rebels and Clone Wars and the Bad Batch, which is why he's I was just what I was just telling Dre is we're we're you know, we just got into episode one of Ahsoka last night because we just finished Rebels like two days ago. Mm-hmm. And and we did it all in preparation to be able to watch Ahsoka. I've heard good things about that, but it's uh... really good. To be honest, but they hate me. Disney plus Dave Filoni they, doesn't. Yeah, but Disney does, and Kathleen Kennedy does, and they've mm-hmm. made they've told me personally that they don't want my money. So I understand. I just so pi- uh, pirate it. Yeah, like why? Why would you just pirate nah, it? I wouldn't. I wouldn't pirate it. Huh. Okay, well, just go ahead and Re- sell. Rebels is really good. It, 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 and the final arc is really cool. And Austin was mad because I predicted two big major events. I was like, oh, this is about to happen. And he just kind of looks at me and then it happened. I was like, ah, ha. And then <laughs> I watched Rebels. I don't, I, I honestly, I can't remember what happened in the last season. Like I remember the, like who the characters are, but. Well, so uh, uh, there was a, there was a, a, a traumatic event. Right. Then there's a big the, deal. the Vader fight, right? Then you don't actually know how it ends. Do they, right. They and then you? it gets, and it right. gets kind of redone. And I, I called that as it was happening. I was like, he's going to, and then that happened. And then the final, final sequence when they beat Thrawn, that mm. I predicted how that was going to end. Is well. the Obi-Wan Darth Maul fight in Rebels? That's, uh, no. I've only I've only seen no. it. I've seen it. Like, it's in Clone War. Yeah. No, is that it is in Clone Wars? That is no, in it's got to be in Rebels. No, it's that's be in Rebels because he's, he's on Tatooine by then. He's old and it's like the same oh, fight yeah, again. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's yeah, like, I've yeah. learned. He's like, have you? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And he's like, I learned too. Yeah. I'm Maul is pretty pre <clears throat> is, is very uh uh prevalent in season. I think it was season three of Rebels. So that's interesting that he'd be prevalent in that season and also he's like the 
the hidden bad guy in solo mm-hmm. is that on purpose is that the parallel i think so because to... so. all of what they've done is all this stuff's heavily interwoven now right and you can't have a star wars movie it in any capacity unless a lightsaber shows up at one, at least at some point it's like a rule and so they had to have darth maul in there for it probably should be a rule yeah i think it is that's probably like in the <laughs> the lucasfilm bible like there, there has <laughs> it was to, in the contract when somebody sold better it. ignite a lightsaber before the credits roll or this ain't a star wars movie but yeah. one of the one of the the lucas fathers brian irvin is going to tell us <laughs> And he's going to, you know, relate what we're supposed to glean from that. And hopefully, you know, generations from now, people will look back and understand. I feel like you're, you're making fun of me, but. Uh... I'm I'm not, I'm making fun of Irenaeus, but whatever. <laughs> same, same. <laughs> well, I, you know, that's not the worst thing anyone's make, making fun of me is the same as making fun of Irenaeus. I mean, I'll take it. Saint Irenaeus of Leo. <laughs> Well, he's French, though. Uh, Which is... Uh, but he was uh, back when French were cool. That's true. He's one of the uh, first young Earthers, right? Um, is he? Was I he? don't know. He, not technically, because I, I think I think what Irenaeus was, was saying was that Genesis is open to interpretation. So a lot of the old church fathers said things of that nature and Irenaeus only talks about the age of the earth only because he was blowing up the Gnostics in his against heresy books. So, you know, cause the Gnostics are saying, well, it's not true because Adam ate the fruit and they said he would die. God's a liar and he wouldn't die that day. And Irenaeus is like, but he did die because a day is a thousand years and he lived to be 930. So yep. He died that day. So it, and, it is interesting how many how many non-literal interpreters interpretations of Genesis there were in the ancient world. Like uh, like like most of them. It was it was it was a it was a normal thing. And yeah. then you know he he quotes Second Peter 3 8, where a day is like a thousand years, and uh yeah. Justin Martyr was a thousand year guy. Um and then you had like Clement of Alexandria. He, him and like Philo were instant creation guys. He's like, so, so God created everything instantly, but then the book of Genesis and how it breaks down creation is, is kind of a, it's a, it's a, it's an interpretation on, on how, in, like the, the order of importance of, of how it went. So it was more of, um, like you know, we you in, you interpret that day for whatever it's supposed to mean in in in, in the Bible. Um, uh, what is that? I don't know what any of that means. Um, so the 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 so I guess there, there's like a like a like a circle thing. You have the six days, and in between those days is stuff that just happened, but 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 creation was instant. So it was just a narrative form to just tell the creation story more than it was what what actually happened it wasn't according giving to you a, philo and it wasn't Clement according to Alexandria. yes they were they were they weren't the Bible the, genesis wasn't giving you a play-by-play it was so it, it's an interesting way that the the church fathers kind of but i think the main point was is it wasn't it wasn't a point to them it, it didn't matter how long the, well, the they knew without the benefit of modern science that right. uh snakes don't talk be <laughs> what yeah of of course which is you know young earth creation what well, bill maher has his his fa- if have you guys seen his uh documentary if you can call it that religious where he uh i've heard of it i haven't i've yet to see it it's in, it was i think he did it in like 2005 2006 mm-hmm. where i remember uh, it he uh i i have it it's been a while i i watched it uh soon after it came out but it it's I lost a lot of respect for Bill Maher. From, not that I had a, a lot of a lot of it to begin with, but I just I was going to say that's yeah. was that was that a big fall from uh, from but, Grace? <laughs> but you know he uh, he goes around interviewing a, a, you know a, th- a theme park actor at a playing Jesus. He he stands outside the Vatican and and uh, you know shakes his fist at the 
at the Vatican because the Pope won't meet with them. And he interviews tourists to kind of trash Catholicism. And he uh, he goes to a, a truck stop chapel and asks them difficult theological questions. I mean, these are truckers who were like going to uh, going to a chapel on their, you know, in, in the middle of a hall at a truck stop. And Bill Maher's there to ask him complex theological questions. And so this is him, like, you know, I'm it's just his asking, big gotcha. Right. But he, you know, he didn't interview like William Lane Craig or um, Gary Habermas or any actual like scholar or reputed theologian. He, he went and interviewed theme park actors and truck stop or tr people at a truck stop chapel and he did interview Francis Collins, who I think was the, uh, it, it may have been, it was around the time he was the head of the Human Genome Project. Um, now he's a, uh, a Fauci uh, henchman. Um, I think he's kind of dishonored himself, but he was, Francis Collins was probably the most credible person he interviewed. And it, you could tell it was heavily edited. Like he would ask him a question and then Francis Collins would, kind of paused for a second but he made it and then they'd cut and it made it look like he was stumped but uh nice it, it was just it was just thoroughly dishonest but one of the things he likes to ask people is do you believe it to, do you believe in talking snakes because if you don't believe in talking snakes well then you don't take the bible very seriously but if you do believe in talking snakes and and of course he the people he asked that to they 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 were the people who gave the answers of uh well if that's what it says in the word of god i believe it that's good enough for me and uh that's his case in point that well christians are, stu are, are stupid and christianity makes you stupid and mm. um but they didn't need the benefit of modern and modern and young earth creationists will claim that not that people who interpret it non-literally are just they it's just because of our weak faith because we're capitulating to modern science um but they didn't have modern science to capitulate to back when in ancient times when they were reading it non-literally but well even even non-ancient times you got like isaac newton and johannesburg kepler and bishop usher they i mean they didn't have any evidence about geology so they're like oh yeah i guess they're four thousand years old it wasn't it wasn't main to them. I think if someone could have presented something to them, especially like Isaac Newton, hey, you know, the earth is just old. He's like, eh, cool, good. So now that I see that. It was like something that. he hadn't given a lot yeah. of thought to. So he was like, right. I don't really have a point of view. And so yeah. I'll use the Basically, Bible he was saying, well. hey, you know, the Genesis was written, you know, 4,000 years ago. Therefore, eh, yeah. Boom. There you go. Yeah. And then a lot, a lot of those like medieval people subscribe to uh, gap interpretation. So you what look is between... that? I, I've heard that reference. Well, I don't know. What so, that is. so what you, between Genesis one and Genesis two, like the, in the beginning, and then and then he starts. They're they're saying that there's unspecified number of years between Genesis one one and Genesis one two, hmm. where there's like this a bunch of chaos. It could have been a million years. Who knows? But before the creation stuff started to start making the actual form, then yeah, maybe hmm. there was there was a time before that. Who, who who subscribed to that? Do you remember anybody? Uh, by it name? was it was no, it was medieval. Hmm. It was it was medieval, and then um, I think like some some uh, some Calvinists, John Calvin, and like his contemporaries were kind of on that. Yeah, for the kids at home, Matt is giving the thumbs down to John Calvin, and uh, I'm not a fan of John Calvin myself, but uh, but, but but really. Uh, Young Earth creationists is a new thing that didn't even start till like the 1900s or the late 1800s when everyone was trying to prove Darwin wrong. So basically, I, it seems as if it started as an anti-Darwin thing and then turned it start, into it's like basically the like hey, off of it. science is going to make the Bible irrelevant. We have to push back on this. When if they would have just been like cool, because the even even at that time. There was a lot of theologians who were pro Darwin, pro they were pro evolution. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of a lot of schools taught evolution, like all all the way up until the the early the early nineteen hundreds, and then the the big time, the big time young Earth creationist literal Bible people started with the Seventh Day Adventists. Is that right? So, mm -hmm. so my girl Ellen G. White, she was a. She was a prophetess, 
and she was pushing back on on Darwin evolutionary. I've I've, she, I've never looked into Seventh Day Adventists. I've always wondered what their what their main difference. I only is, took aside a peek from at them. the whole Saturday Sunday thing. I was like, there's got to <laughs> yeah, be more they, to it than just a day of the week, right? I took a peek at them because they were they're connected to the Branch Davidians, so that's how. Yeah, really? so that's kind of how they how that evolved into the, that's the, the nearest church to my house is an SDA church. I drive past it like constantly, and I'm always like, hmm, I wonder what goes on in there. Hmm. Then some dude named Price, what did he do? He wrote some some book and had like this flood theory. And the reason why geologists mistake these years is because all this all the sedimentary laid down during the flood. Therefore, all of the flood, that, meaning the deluge or a, a different the, flood, that one. Yeah. Okay. The Genesis flood. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah. I have not personally studied the the history of young earth creationism that much. I just know that. I just know well, you wrote it, a blog about it. Well, <laughs> I, and, and by the way, this blog of yours is my favorite one, for two reasons. One, it was the first of your blogs that I read. And two, because you have a picture of Jesus on a dinosaur. Yeah, I also I've also updated that since then to to, dis, to disavow much of what I wrote in it. I just I just thought it was abusing to me. Yeah, it, it, but uh, I, I felt like because I, if I remember right, you start off with I don't believe the Earth is only five thousand year old years old, and neither does Jesus or something like that is what you wrote. In. I think the title the title was uh, uh, why I'm not a young Earth creationist and Jesus wasn't either. Yeah, to be honest, he he might have been. Um, um, I'm pretty sure he knew better. Well, we, we, we tend to think of Jesus as basically just God walking around omniscient and omnipotent wearing a human suit. Um, but he, he was a man of his time. He was God in his person, in his consciousness, but he wasn't, he wasn't intrinsically omniscient. Um, people of his time i'm sure read the book of genesis and took it took it literally now i, I but they say, didn't they didn't take it literally they I, well let me let me let me explain that i would i was about to say i, I want to put literally with an asterisk sure um, a john walton literally um yeah um but like basically uh like reading the text itself you understand like if you take the cues from the text itself you understand that it can't be talking about literal 24-hour days because it the, on the first day um he's he separates light he creates time by separating light from darkness um and, and that's why and that he's creating time is apparent because why doesn't he just call the light light and darkness darkness? He calls the light day and the darkness night because he just created time. But there's no way to to measure time until the fourth day when he puts the sun, moon, and stars in Correct. the firmament. Right. You me. have to have all of the things in order to right. create the concept of an earth day. Yeah. And they understood as well as we do that plants need sunlight. That's why you have all of these pagan myths about the uh, the vegetative gods who die in the winter and then they're reborn in the spring because i understand that you need sunlight for plants and there's less sunlight in winter and that's why they die so that wasn't oh and it's that cold. wasn't temperature um, has a lot to do with it well i don't think i don't think the length of the day matters as much to a plant as its operating temperature well but they understood that it had it was connected to the sun that the sun being well, there less time was connected to the to the plants dying in the winter and that, and all of these, you know, these, these religions that are related to harvest time that they all kind of revolve around that. Um, so they understood that back then and they understood the snakes don't talk, but, um, but yeah, they, they probably, they all probably believe that the earth was flat and, sat beneath a solid dome that kept the, the cosmic waters above from falling down and joining the waters below and um yeah there were some people who had figured out that the earth that the earth was round but that wasn't that wasn't common knowledge um so but um but also if you read genesis and you take it strictly literally you don't get creation out of nothing 
like at least not explicitly it doesn't say creation out of nothing it says that everything was water and darkness right and then god began there's an then, order there's an ordering but it's not the creation of it's just the ordering of what pre-existed right but you do yeah. get like that phrase creation out of nothing that originates in second maccabees 7 14 i think um second maccabees 7 somewhere um that's the first time there's any mention in in any human literature, at least that has survived, of God creating everything out of nothing, mm -hmm. and that well, kind of became I the had standard. Read, I had heard or read something that the more important the takeaway from Genesis one isn't about the timeline, that the important part was all of the other versions of creation mythology revolved around some god having to fight another god and wrestle the the control from one to another or kill another one or two had to be joined there was all of this having to borrow well, from another god in order for it, for their god to create and the difference well, hang on and the difference in our version of creation is that our god simply decreed it to happen and it just did he didn't have to go fight and beat up another god or steal somebody's dirt or impregnate some other deity he just looked around and goes, I want this to happen. And it did. And that, that yeah. is, that's what we should be taking away from Genesis, not getting focused on like the timeline about, well, was it 24 hours or 36 hours or whatever? But uh, another major feature that all other creation accounts have in common is that they, they picture the, the God, they, they picture the gods emerging within a pre-existent universe. It's not right. These, these stories are not about the origin of the universe. They're right. about the origin of the gods. The right. universe is always there, but Correct. then that's the exactly, God, that's exactly the same. Yep. Right. The sky God gets with the earth goddess and they have kids and those kids are the ocean and the, mm -hmm the stars and the storm and all that stuff. And, and then they fight and there's always like an, like an intermediate stage of, of pagan religious development where the storm God gets promoted to creator God right. by slaying a cosmic dragon. Right. And then the, uh, the dragon is the carcass of the dragon. It becomes the, becomes the earth. And, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, but yeah. And the, so it's, it's a polemic where it it's God just, speaking it into existence there's no mm -hmm. chaos to tame it's just him ordering what was previously he orders by differentiating opposites he creates distinction between opposites light from darkness for time up from down for space dry land from water for for earth creates hum humanity by separating male from female um and then all the animal life they each reproduce according to its kind um but um whereas in the in the uh well i'm trying to i don't want to get ahead of myself here i i was explaining to somebody yesterday about uh how there are only two religions in the world and we've had this conversation and <clears throat> but that that might be a conversation for our uh our uh, when we we were talking about talking about uh, occultism and its relation to modern culture and the divine council worldview, but that might be that, that might be best saved for that. So, way to, way to peel it. the curtain back on our on our yeah. show development and our our, yeah. uh, our transitions. Yeah, well, it's uh, <laughs> big fourth wall break there. I don't, I don't think that I don't think there's a fourth wall, man. I think they see I think they see past the fourth wall. Yeah. So, uh, all right. I ran out of stuff to say. I, clearly. Oh. <laughs> wow. <Well, laughs> Brian's like, a... I'm so out of stuff. I'm just going to blow up the show. So this isn't magic, by the way, guys. Um, <laughs> there's nothing super cool about what we do. And I'm done. <laughs> Thanks, Brian. <laughs> Thank you. There, there was a dude named uh, John Whitcomb Jr. And he uh, he was mad that uh, that a bunch of scientists were shitting all over this dude Price. Those were the Seventh Day Adventists. So he decided he was going to write a book uh, based on the same thing, but he couldn't find any geologists to like help him because he, I guess, he wrote some doctoral doctoral thesis and uh, and everyone kind of rejected it because he's not a scientist. So he found what a dude. His name? his name Whitcomb Jr. John Whitcomb. 
he found a he found a guy uh, Henry Morris who was a scientist. The thing I forget what he did, but he wasn't a geologist, and he signed off. He said, "We're going to write this book," and they they come up with the the Genesis flood, which sounds a lot like Price's book of the of the flood that caused all this all this stuff, and uh, they sold about ten thousand copies in the first year. And then they sold 100,000 copies. And then these two just went on like tour around the world. This is like in the 60s and the 70s and started talking about these things. And they kind of caught on. And uh, and they started um, the Creation Research Society or CRS. And then Morris founded the Institute of Creation Research, ICR. And all of that gave rise to Creation Ministries International and Answers in Genesis. So then by the 90s, if you were a creationist at all, then you were synonymous with young earth creation. And that's kind of where the, the that, science that, versus I Christianity. I think that tracks with, you know, at least personally, my my growing up, right? I didn't know that there was this big science versus Christianity dispute, right? And some of it's just because I grew up Southern Baptist. I grew up in, I was going to high school in Oklahoma, which is, you know, at the time had to have been 95% Protestant Christian in Oklahoma at the time. Um, and I remember going to church my senior year in high school and my pastor was talking about somehow we got onto creationism and, and he brought in a, an author. So this is 1994, maybe it was 93. He brought this author in and he's, and he'd written a book. I don't, I don't know the guy's name. I wish I did. Cause it might be relevant. You know, might, the book could be good. Who knows? Um, but he was talking about how he wrote a book that explains that believing in the concept of creation doesn't have to obviate modern science. And that was and you're like, no this. shit. And I was like, <laughs> I'm sitting in church and I'm like, wait, this is a revelation to people. Like, cause I had just naturally just kind of dovetailed the two concepts in my brain. It just made sense to me. Right. I was like, you know, the Bible says, you know, on this day and I, in my brain, I was just like, well, what kind of a goofball thinks that it meant 24 hours? Like, why does God operate on a 24 hour clock? Like, that's weird. Especially when there wasn't a planet. Like, there has to be a planet to <laughs> rotate in order to know right, what 24 right. hours is. Like, did God time the rotation of our planet to match the the watch that He's already wearing? That He just like those. That, <laughs> I, I had right. never even really thought about these things. This is just what went on in my head. And so I'm sitting there, and I'm like wait, this is, this is a thing, right? And people were like interested. There was like lots of, I remember there being a lot of energy in that service. And I don't know if, like, if it was well-received or not. I don't remember. I was a dumb kid. Like I wasn't like connected in what was going on with the church elders and whatnot. But um, I just kind of walked away from that. Like, oh, I mean, I guess I wrote a book about it too. So I didn't know it was a problem, but I don't have a problem. Like, this is just the way it is. <laughs> and right. then it, it was like probably four or five years later, as I started, you know, becoming an adult and I started hearing people make these comments about, oh, you Christian science deniers. And I was like, wait, what? I, I, I really didn't know that 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 young earth cre creationism was even existed or that it was a problem. And I didn't understand why there were so many angry non-Christians out there shaking their fists about believe the science. And I'm like, what are y'all talking about? I, I think it's so weird that that from the beginning of Christianity, they've worked hand in hand with science. Right. And then all of a sudden in the 1920s, there starts to be a little bit of pushback on science because of how broadly evolution was was mm -hmm. brought into this thing. And then by the 60s, or like it's a fifth the, the 30s through the 50s, you know, only Seventh day Adventists were were young earth creationists in fact most most creation type people or theologists were like yeah, yeah that tracks evolution could work i don't know maybe your theory on evolution is wrong but yeah whatever <laughs> and then and then lots of other christians but and then all of a sudden a couple of books get written and science kind of comes to the forefront and then it becomes this this versus that, where if you believe in science, then you can't believe in the Bible. Right. It was very much like, a zero, wait, what? Sum, zero sum game, right? It was like you're, you're but with it's us only or against been us. Over the last 30 years, so that's been a thing. It, that's what's be honest, wild. I, just, just looking at the history of it, I mean, I gave you the timeline. Yeah. It started in the 20s, in the 60s. It didn't take root until the 90s. And from yeah. 90 until now, it's like people are like they're willing to fight over it. 
and it's, and it's just because people hate Darwin and they're mm-hmm. scared the Bible is going to get thrown in the trash. Right. Right. So they created like, this like visceral response to it. And it's not, it's not, it's not logical to me the way they. And accommodationism is something that that's the wrong response to the the whole debate. Accommodationism is where people read the book of Genesis and try to explain, no, 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 no. Here's how it does fit in mm-hmm. how it right. supports modern right, science. Right. Mm-hmm. Like here, this is right. where it's talking about the big bang. I used to do that. Like, that's why I, I put the, that's why I put the, like the, the note on my my blog denouncing what I had written because that's basically what I was doing and it was well, ill-advised. Yeah. Well, what's crazy is that like tomorrow mm-hmm. we might learn that the Big Bang is false, mm-hmm. right? And we might come up with a new way that everything happened yep. according to science. And then and what we're going to do, try to make Genesis fit into that too? Like, stop it. Right. But the thing is, it is worth mentioning that when the Big Bang was first introduced, by George Lemaitre, a uh, Catholic priest and physics professor, incidentally, it was rejected. It was laughed at. Like Big Bang is a pejor- it's it's a it's a pejorative to to dismiss it because it was too close to the Book of Genesis, as as they they believe they they had the Fred Hoyle came up with the steady state model as the alternative to the Big Bang, which has hmm. it that the universe has always been here and always will be. But it kind of goes back to what I was saying about there's only there's only two religions in the world. Um, either God is eternal and the universe is contingent upon God or the universe is eternal and all life and consciousness and the gods themselves emerge from within this pre-existing and eternal universe. And it's really the same thing in physics. Like like physics, the default setting was the universe has always been here and always will be. That was Fred Hoyle's steady state model. And then there's the Big Bang Theory, which is the universe had a beginning, which by necessity means it had to have had a cause that preceded it, which plays into the one of the two options for religions. But, um, you know, so when... When young earth creationists reject the Big Bang theory for being anti-Christian, well, they they're they haven't really thought it through. So, yeah, I I I, I haven't spent a lot of time trying to understand the point of view because it it's one of those points of view that just strikes me as so like hard to I can't get there. You know, like I try to, when I'm, when I'm having a a philosophical discussion or whatever with a person, I try to get to where they're at so I can at least see what they're trying to feel, say, express. And then I can, then I kind of work my way back to where I'm at and maybe I end up where they are or I don't. But with, when it comes to this hyper literal interpretation, I just, I can't get there. I can't, It, it, it just, I tr- the minute I try, I just can't. And I just like, oh, it's not happening. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. I, I'm, I, maybe we need to have a, a young earth creationist on the show to. Oh, for sure. When we, we start to, getting guests. Yeah. Cause I think, I think this one's probably going to draw some, some, uh, this yeah. will be one of our first ones to draw some anger from, from a, a, a chunk of our audience. So hopefully maybe somebody will want to come on the show and give their, uh, their counterpoint. But it's also why apologetics is so important. Like if, 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 if we have a church culture that teaches people why it's true, it, you know, it, it trains you to have a, a, a rational epistemology where you can, you know, you base your beliefs on what you can, you can, what there's evidence for, what you can reason out from that evidence. Um, we don't really have that that kind of a culture. And that's, that's the culture that you find in the early church. That's, that's how they won converts. And that's how they got people to turn their backs on centuries of cultural and religious tradition and become Christians by persuading them that it's actually true by making arguments that were based on evidence and reason that they, Mm. that they believed. And there's, you know, I've, I've collected the verses from the book of Acts where it has, you know, Paul, Paul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. He argued, he persuaded, he made the case. 
Um, and then people heard the case and they believed we, we treat apologetics as kind of a, kind of an option today is it's sort of a subset when I think it, I think it should be so essential that we shouldn't even think in terms of apologetics as a separate discipline. It should just be Christianity and just initiating people into Christianity should be convincing them why it's true, giving them the case and then mentoring them as as Christians is teaching them how to make that case to others. And along with that, of course, you have to, you have to live by it. I mean, if you're right. And it's, it's funny, like we were, but, but there, there could be an argument made, Brian, you know, to, to, to follow up with what you're saying is that if maybe if, if more people were taught their religion in a way that they actually believed it such that they could explain it to somebody else completely, it might be a whole lot harder to backslide. Yeah. Because, I because you would, you would understand it more fully. Right. Um, mm. uh, I think I, I'd like to think in the last, you know, five years or so, since I've been doing some real serious reading and I've really been trying to dig into and understand more of how and what and why I believe what I believe it's actually strengthened my personal faith by a, an amount that I can't even put into words. Right. Um, and that doesn't, that's not to say that my, any of that faith is blind because there's some things that I just straight up don't believe anymore that I used to, or vice versa used to not believe that now I do, but regardless that the end product is much greater than it was 15 years ago when I was just kind of chilling. Hey, yeah, I'm a Christian. Yeah. You know, and and really when you when you go through these arguments for God's existence and you like and you actually realize that they're true, um, especially the argument for the resurrection, but also the cosmological, the moral argument, the teleological argument, the argument from consciousness, what like when you when you think it through and when you you follow the reasoning and you grasp it for yourself that this is actually true. And that God actually exists, it it changes your consciousness. Like it it your it realigns your perspective, the way you the way you understand reality and your place within it. And like I don't like to, I don't I don't believe that God exists. I I can't help but know that He exists. Like it like when you you know with, like the moral argument, for instance, when you realize how meaningless the idea of morality itself is if God doesn't exist, well, now you can't help but see him everywhere. Like he's like my every interaction is God is present in that because I, because I understand what, what right and wrong are. And that like, we just sort of passively take that for granted without, without thinking that through. And we, you know, that we can even entertain debate in our civilization about whether, whether, whether God exists or whether objective morality can exist apart from God, I think, I think that that shows a, a profound weakness, a, a profound failure on the part of the church to just to teach basic, basic theology, basic tenets of the faith. So I'm going to say this. We've been, we're a little, we're a little into the show. I don't want to, I don't want to dive into this. I really dislike the moral argument and maybe I don't understand it well. So I want to follow this up with you on, a, on another episode because okay. I, 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 I don't like it. And like I said, maybe, <laughs> maybe I, maybe I, I haven't had it presented clearly to me. Maybe I haven't thought it through well enough, but the couple of times I've addressed it, I struggle with it. So just kind of putting that out there to, I want to so, well, stick a pin in it. Like I said, I, I want to stick a pin in it. Cause I don't, we're not going to, you're going to tell me you can, you can explain it to me really quickly. And then you're going to talk for about 10 minutes and then I'm going to argue with you. And then 45 minutes from now, we're going to be further down the road. So no, I appreciate, well, I appreciate your belief that you can succinctly make this a simple case, but it's not. And, and this is far from the first time I've addressed it or thought about it. So no, we'll have to do it on another show. Mm, well, that's uh so you're just going to drop that out there and mm -hmm. just, not. Yeah, I'm just tossing it out there. That's something we need to address on another episode. We can do yeah. it next week, maybe, or the week after, after we talk about Crowley and well, and, let's and just tease it. What? I I, I just I just I can't I I can't 
I can't wrap my mind around the idea that morality only exists because of God, because I know people that are wildly atheist or agnostic, and they're capable of making moralistic determinations. But they were created by God. And and their ability, well, yeah, but that's that uh, created by versus being guided by or driven by or, 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 okay. or inspired by is different. And that's that's that be, where it breaks it could down. It'd be a good talk, yeah, for sure. Yeah, the, the moral argument is not you have to believe in God or or you won't have morality. No, I understand that. It's because God exists, morals exist. I, I understand what it is. So, well, the argument is actually <laughs> because you're already moral. Like, it's not that if you don't believe in God, you don't, you don't have morality. It's that, that people are already moral. Therefore God exists. I know. And I think that's an asinine wizard's duel statement mm. because it's, because it's set up to be dis- <laughs> undisprovable. Well, no, it's not. Yeah, it is. I, I will say this based on just the moral argument alone. It, it might be, it is entirely possible that morality is nothing but a social construct. But to believe that is to take a leap into absurdity. You can't live that way. I, I I don't disagree with that. And for those at home, I was nodding my head as Brian said that. This is exactly where my argument comes from, is that morality is, as much as I hate to say this out loud, because this is going to get twisted and we're going to have to have this follow on conversation, morality is relative. There are things that you, the three of us, or some of our listeners would consider to be moral absolutes that are relative based on your setting, the the the, the era I mean, slavery was a was a relative morality issue. It come, I mean, come at me. I, there was plenty of people that were wholly right. convinced that it was fully more moralistic to have slaves. Yes, the whole world, right? Not not America. Everyone, everybody, everyone, right? And Christians, Since by the, the way, are the ones that time. decided it wasn't yeah. okay, and right. you know, rightly so. But th- that that was a changing paradigm. That was an Overton window ex- thing that happened. It wasn't. It wasn't. Uh, 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 because it was written so it shall be it's always been this but way because it freaking Matt, wasn't. We, are, we are doing exactly what you said we it's were like going i'm a to freaking do. prophet or something right yeah right <laughs> so. i agree that morality is relative but it's either relative to an absolute or it's or it's relative to something that is itself relative and it unravels but let me back up a little bit brian no um, no, I'm not no. backing up because we're not going to do this because this is going to turn into a two hour conversation. No, I'm going to, I'm going I'm to clarify my position. It's no. Not even <laughs> Brian, no means no. Why, why are you this theologically is, is, raping is, us? I was about to say that this is, this is philosophical rape occurring that's, right now. This is, it's a little, this is over, uncon- it's a little this is over the top. Touching. Stop it. Stop it. When I first became a Christian, I, w- I mean, it was, I was in that crowd of people who, who believe that way. I I believed that way. Um, I I would I denied evolution for a few years, um, just for because it, it you know those arguments made sense. Um, if if death for natural selection to happen, death had to have been in the world before Adam's fall. Um, if Adam's fall brought about the brought about the existence of death, then it it evolution can't be true. And I was a I was a Bible believing hmm. born again Christian. And so that's, that's what I was going with. And so I would, uh, you know, I, I kind I kind of fought back against evolution when I encountered it, but it was just such a, an uphill. I, I, I couldn't do that honestly for very long. Like it just, the, the, the science is sufficient and coherent and, uh, now I understand the Bible better and that that's not at all what it teaches. Death came into the world because Adam wasn't intrinsically immortal. He was denied access to the tree of life. And that's how death came to, to mm. humans. Right. Um, if you actually read the text, there was no, there was never any intention that Adam would die, but only because he had access to the tree of life, not because he was intrinsically immortal or death didn't happen anywhere. Well, but, but so I, I don't know that that I, I'm listening to you and, and we're on the same team here. So I'm, 
this is our our first podcast that we're actually fully aligned, but I'm I want to press on what you said. And maybe I've never heard this argument from a from a YEC before. But the idea that death had to pre-exist Adam in order for evolution to occur to get to Adam, that's the that's that that's is that a primary pushback? Yeah, like for natural selection to happen, like natural selection uh-huh. is basically like you if you're not fit for survival, you get killed off before well, you I know reproduce. How, yeah, no, I, I get that part. I, I guess I've always I've always looked at and I've heard this argument, right, from from non evolutionists. They're like, show me the show me the linkage, show me the 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 monkey that turned into a man, right? Right. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's the big pushback. Right. Like where where is the where's the, the middle? Where's the, 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 the missing mis- link? Yeah. Right. And and I, I, to me, it's a little more simple than that because uh, I don't have a problem with the concept of all of the previous humanoids. Right, hominids, uh, Neanderthals, hominids, whatever. Yeah, um, and and so if I look at Genesis, you know, one twenty seven, um, when God is speaking to the divine council and He says, "Let us make, create, let us make man in our image," um, or is it twenty eight, twenty twenty six? Sorry, one twenty six. When He's speaking to the council, um, just had to throw that. I had to throw that in there, by the way, to make sure that uh, we stay on. Still on message. Harumph. Um <laughs> I didn't get a harumph out of this guy. Um <laughs> but uh you know to me that's just the that was the emergence of 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 human, right? Which is different from you know the the previous proto man that existed. Um and and oh by the way, and we can I don't remember if we've had this conversation before or not, but Genesis speaking that, you know, God created Adam and then Eve doesn't preclude him having created other humans instantaneously after that, right? The the pre-population of the entire planet could have occurred within seconds of Adam and Eve being birthed uh, or maybe after the fall, whatever. Uh, And I'm alluding to, you know, when Cain was cast out and went and found his wife and and Nod. Right. Well, that, like, that's when Cain's like, well, if I go there, people are going to kill me. Right. Well, who, 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 who are who, these people? Correct. Right, yeah. right. And I've heard and I've heard the counter argument that those are just other descendants of Adam and Eve that had just gone off. And I'm like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Really? Like Cain's the first dude. Like, why, why, why would he have gone off and found his wife as a sister of his that had just left t- home earlier that he was going to go meet in another town like that just doesn't track from a from a, you know, in my mind. So the idea that other humans were seated around the earth, um, kind of tracks with the concept that there were proto humans that had been seated around the earth. Right. And they just weren't pleasing to God or they were developing in a manner that he didn't, didn't fit his design. And so he needed to push the envelope and force the hand of evolution to, well, to create. You guys have heard me talk about the difference between anatomical modern humans and behaviorally modern humans, right? No, no. But being a being, I'm being that I'm, I'm somewhat of a behaviorist myself. I'm interested to hear your your theory. Um, I think I think we did talk about this, but it was like several weeks ago. But uh, so basically, the way modern anthropologists uh, see it is that there were there were anatomically modern humans, which, as the as the name implies, they're anatomically identical to us. Um, behaviorally modern humans they distinguish by their ability to to think and communicate in abstract symbolic terms i.e hmm. language interesting um and that's that and our our powers of language is what gives us our our creative powers it's the reason we can create technology and um economies and institutions and governments and laws and tell stories it's because of our our capacity for sounds language like, sounds like this guy sapiens that's right yeah yeah <laughs> yeah we yeah it kind of tracks with that yeah you brought that up last time i okay okay but um but what's interesting is um if you guys have heard the, the word abracadabra right yep mm-hmm. and this is going to matter for when we talk about occultism later on because this is like a major yep. component of, of of occult thinking um, a lot of occultism, it's it's predicated on things you find in the Bible. I mean, it, it like the Bible is the foundation, and the irony is that a lot of people they they kind of turn their nose up at Christianity, but they 
they turn to magic and occultism to fill the religious void, but they don't understand what's going on there because they haven't read the Bible and they sneer at it. But a lot of the ideas that you find in Crowley and John Dee and and a lot of Western occultism anyway was an underground version of Christianity. Um, and so if you don't understand the Bible, then you're not going to understand any of that. But one of the major, the phrase abracadabra, um, we've, we've all heard that. It sounds like a nonsense word that magicians say at kids' birthday parties to, um, it actually, it, it's actually very meaningful. It's Aramaic for, as I speak, I create. And it, and it, 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 uh, it highlights the creative power of language. And in, 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 in the Kabbalah, they talk about how Adam had, he participated with God's act of, God spoke the universe into creation. And then Adam participated in that, that creative process by naming the animals. He didn't create ex nihilo as God did, but he created kind of an order to the animal world by assigning them names. Um, and it's to that creative power that they, uh, they, it's that creative power that makes us in God's image. Um, and so that's the, by being able to create by language, that's what separates us from the animals. And it's a, uh, so going back to the Genesis account, I, I would say Adam is the first behaviorally modern human. Um, so there would have had to have been anatomically modern humans around. And the way anthropologists describe this, they, they compare it to, uh, to music, like there's probably only a few hundred people in the entire world who are capable of writing a hit song. Um, but anybody can learn to play music and anybody who hears the song can then play that song and it's going to catch on. And that's kind of how language is like once, once the first behaviorally modern humans started talking and started assigning symbols, it's like start, started assigning phonetic symbols to objects and naming things, then other people could communicate, then he could communicate with others and they, they learn how to do it. Like you can teach a monkey or a gorilla sign, how to language. sign language, yeah. but they're never going to come up with that on their own. Right. And so if there's, if there are behaviorally modern humans who can speak, then anatomically modern humans can, can learn to do it. And then there's really no distinction between behaviorally modern and anatomically modern humans, because now they're all learning to speak and they're all taking on the behavior. And so Adam was kind of, and this does kind of like parallel when Jesus is, is called the second Adam and in, in his messianic role, the, the thing that makes him the Messiah he passes that on to other people. He, he, it's through him that we receive the Holy spirit. And so we're, we are remade in the image of God through Adam anatomically modern humanity was sort of transformed into the image of God by this, this one person having been made in the image of God, but because he fell, he was able to pass on the, the capacity, the, the, the abracadabra magic of creation through speech um, but humanity was corrupted. Like they were still bestial. They were still animalistic, but now they had the powers of the creative powers of speech to add to it. But, uh, anyway, that was, no, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I don't hate that theory. That's, that's it. it like I said, I, I held up this book and it, it's for those that didn't see me hold it up. It's sapiens by Yuval Noah Harari. And he makes a point and, I don't want to oversell his book because I think he's kind of tied into some of the Bill Gates stuff. And I don't necessarily agree with all of his other uh, pushes, but he he's explaining the evolution of human humans and, and what made us different. And he, and really similar to what Brian just said, he calls it our ability to, 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 to believe in fiction. And it's basically, he explains how, you know, you think about an old wizard movie and there's the, you know, the, the the special people put on the special robes. They go to the sacred place and they say the magic words and things happen, right? Abracadabra. And while that seems fanciful and you're conjuring in your mind, like, you know, the guy in the purple robes with the big pointy hat and the big beard, if you think about it, that's literally what happens in a courthouse in the United States, right? A judge puts on his robe, sits at his special 
seat in the special building and he makes decisions and whacks a hammer on a piece of wood and whatever he said is now actually real then we have to abide by it and that's fiction because a law a governmental system isn't real you can't touch it but yet we all just nod our heads and go along and it's part of what makes humanity work right and that work that that's that lends itself to religion to the maths and sciences laws of grammar you know street signs you know the, how we don't crash into each other as we're going down the road and we don't turn the interstates into genuinely mad max type situations although sometimes we might think it is that way right like all of these things is our ability to comprehend fiction in order to make our lives better um, yeah, and that's so, so much of what makes up that human life is a construct of language mm -hmm. and has no existence exactly. apart from that exactly and it's it's a when, when i read that in that book i was like wow i mean this guy's wildly you know non-religious or a religious or even anti-religious but this one concept makes a lot of sense and it is what distinguishes us from any other animal right like our and it talks about and, it, and i'm still in you guys should read the book it's not youtube but anybody who's listening read the book it's fascinating he explains if you would take a, a human and a gorilla silverback gorilla and pit them one-on-one -on -one in, in 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 mortal combat the gorilla wins instantly like in seconds right like the human doesn't stand a chance 10 men against 10 gorillas the gorillas are still going to win but there's a tipping point when you get into the hundreds and the thousands where the humans have an ability to organize and strategize and be tactical in a way that the gorillas could never do and the humans will win. And then you get into the tens of thousands and it's not even a discussion. Humans now become wildly dominant and that's how militaries work, right? Again, back to governance and- uh, oh, we start experimenting on them and making them smart. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's Damn an interesting- Caesar. It's an interesting uh, thought experiment, right? The way this guy presents it in this book. And I think, Brian, it, it really goes exactly with what you just said. And that, and and I've kind of, I, I didn't think about it in the terms of the way you said it of this, you know, behaviorally versus anatomically consistent, but I think it's, it's just as, it's just as plausible as what was what happened, right? Is God said, this is the one I want modeled after me. And suddenly, boom, he was Adam and he was different. And, and that's, that's all you need. You didn't need it to be the first mutated non monkey human that popped out of a monkey mama that just didn't have hair, right? Like, I don't think it's that dramatic. It was something of more along the lines of Adam was just like, huh? Do, re, mi, fa, so, la, ti, do, right? Like all of a sudden he <laughs> uses voice in a way that all the other humans hadn't been able to do. And she's like, Adam, I don't know what you're talking about. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk a lot more than you. And you're going to listen to exactly what I say, Adam. Do you understand? And he's like, why did I make up language? Yeah. Son of a bitch. Th thanks a lot, Shania Twain. <laughs> yeah. uh, it, well, um, isn't lots of Near Eastern myths kind of kind of fall on that line too. Like what's that, uh, the story of Gilgamesh? kind of rings a bell like he's he's like this like almost nephilim type creature that's out there he's strong he's renowned but not until they seduce him with a woman that he gets he becomes civilized all of a sudden i'm, I'm not i'm not i don't know the whole story but that, that kind of that's like the the wave top highlights of of what i what i think it is yeah there is there is definitely a a uh a theme there about how women civilized men and how he was basically just this kind of this self-centered brute who just went around exerting his power. All his, to all his toxic masculinity. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> Which is, I, I recently watched rewatched the Mad Max trilogy. Um, like as a kid, I like, I must've seen it a million times, but it never, I never thought much of it. I just thought it was typical eighties action movie machismo and, there wasn't much more to it, but it's actually pretty, it's a pretty deep story. It's it, like, it's definitely saying things about masculinity and civilization and water, stuff like water. that. Well, gasoline. Oh yeah. G gasoline is the, 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 uh, the big economic driver there, but, um, but it, it's definitely like it's saying something similar to Gilgamesh about. Uh, so I don't want to give the whole thing away or get into a big analysis of Mad Max. But I was going to say uh, give away. It's been like forty years. I think it came out in nineteen seventy nine. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, for people who haven't seen it, it's, uh, oh, 
by by the way, my brother still hasn't listened to our episode on the sound of freedom because he hasn't seen it yet and didn't want to have it spoiled. <laughs> That's funny. So he he listened to my warning, not Brian's wave off of our spoiler alert. And that's, that's smart. <laughs> He's like la 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 la. Yeah, I kind Exit. of tricked people. I felt bad about that. <laughs> okay, we're not going to do spoilers, but then it it ends with uh, he dies in the end. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's, uh, I think it's John D and his Enochian callings. Mm-hmm. Where yeah. where the book is is an audible, right? So, what it does is, <laughs> is it, the it book is you, in Enochian. It, it, yes, so the guy will say it right in English, and when you want to cast that in Enochian, then he's like, <laughs> and I'm like, why is the dude speaking Klingon? It's weird, but uh, but yeah, so I'm like, I can learn how to summon these things now because I have the audible version. Don't do it. Knocking in calls. Yeah, yeah even do not even, do it. Even as a joke, don't don't do that. So, for Aww. the kids at home, since we're talking about this anyway, I talked about the 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 importance of language in occultism and also in biblical thinking. Um, John Dee's thing. He was a wizard. He was a an occultist during the time of Elizabeth, like the, the British empire, according to him, their British empire was uh, the idea of the angels with whom he was communing. But his whole thing was he, he was trying to commune with angels to recover the original language spoken by Adam in the garden. And that's what Enochian was. And if he, the belief was if he could recover this language and he could speak the same language as Adam, as Adam, then he could, he could open the way to re- to using that, the creative power of that language to restore the earth to paradise. And this would, this would hasten the second coming of Christ. Um, and it was, there was this whole plan where Queen Elizabeth was going to, he was going to be the Merlin to the, to the new Merlin to Queen Elizabeth's new Arthur, and she was going to rule over this new Christian, this this new uh, multinational kingdom of Christianity that included the new world, and uh, that was kind of the big the the big plan he was getting from the angels, and so uh, it, it's just it's one of the many ways that you know that this this idea you find in the Bible. That's, that's valid in and of itself kind of gets in Western occultism, they, they, they plant their flag on it and then they run with it into crazy town. And like, there's a, there's a true principle in which language is, is a, is a creative power, but they thought it was like a, a magical power to speak things into existence and to create ex nihilo and to, to change the universe around you merely with the power of speech. And so it's, uh, that's isn't, just that a teaser. What, isn't that what, what Tesla thought too. So, and, and really he, he thought that, you know, human beings put off electricity mm-hmm. because of, you know, the heartbeat puts out what 12 Hertz or something like that. And you have this field around you. And then he, what was this? Some kind of round thing that if he could synchronize it with the right frequency, it could have everlasting power forever and it'd be free. Mm-hmm. And all all we'd have to do was just find the right frequency to have enough electricity wanted, for everyone. He wanted wire. He was trying to create wireless power. I didn't know about the the endless it, power thing. It all oh, it yeah, all had it to was, do with yeah. it all had to do with sound. Yep. Yep, it had to do with harnessing all of the the harmonics and the frequencies coming off of everything, and that there was the energy just existed, and it wasn't right. just it wasn't just wireless transmission. It was, it was like the ability to just draw it out of, right? Because even rocks give world. off, even though not as much as us. But so even so, even when you're thinking positive thoughts, you put off more electricity. So happy people put off more. That's why you have the like all these new ways people talk about you got the right vibe, man, because you're actually putting out the right, a different vibration than somebody who is, who is down. I'm not aware of Nikola Tesla saying all that. Yeah. I'm not disputing it. I just, yeah, I didn't. Yeah, I, Dre, the thing was called an oscillator. Oscillator. Oh, interesting. Because yeah. then we, we can measure things by our oscillators mm-hmm. when we were doing our, our, uh, our Intel magic. Yep. Yeah. 
Yeah. So that'll that that'll be uh, that'll be next week. We'll uh, talking we'll, about we'll dive into uh, Tesla's that. oscillations. Well, we'll ju- we'll jump all around it with Mister Crowley and <laughs> the crazy he, the crazy train. He's he's creepy, man. My man's creepy. That, like a couple of his books were only like two dollars, so I bought them. Like what the fuck? Never mind. <laughs> Never mind, man. Like like he. He starts he starts down like what sounds like a, a good road and then he just gets weird with it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, you 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 took a weird left turn and I'm not I'm not down with what you're what you're pitching here. You was he the the most wicked man ever? Is that was like his, his That's what the moniker? tabloids called him? Um he probably encouraged that because he was a, a attention starved exhibitionist. Right. But uh yeah, it's 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 funny all the people who who get into occultism, like they read Harry Potter and they think it's something cool to get into, and they get into Wicca and they right. they you know there there's a there's a draw to it because you feel like you're you know you're you're in this special group where you're privy to these these secrets that are denied to normal people, and you're special in your communion with these these larger forces and learning all these deep hidden things. Um, if you're drawn to that f- with ambitions of importance or becoming great through it, well, you're never going to be, you're never going to achieve more success or renown in magic than John D or Aleister Crowley. And they Those were, guys losers. were giant losers. They were <laughs> so just, <laughs> well, like, I mean, but it's always been a, so it's, to be honest, like if you look at uh, Adolf Hitler, right. And his, his obsession with the occult. What was he trying to do? He was trying to gain an upper hand to win World War II, right? It's like he. It's almost you well, could almost you could almost restate. But... What do you mean it's arguable? Well, it, it's that, arguable that he was, whether he was obsessed with the occult or he was trying to win World War II. It's arguable whether his obsession with the cult had to do with actually getting a tactical advantage by supernatural means, or if it was just a kind of a cultural driver for his for the German people, like something to organize. I feel like you've never watched Indiana Jones prior, (laughs) (laughs) but I mean, it's my bad. You're right. (laughs) But but they're one in the same. He wanted the Ark of the fucking covenant. Not not necessarily. No, it's it's one. It's one in the same in that if he wants his, his, he wanted his Aryans to, to be prominent, that requires everybody else to be less than, which requires him to win the war. Like, I, I, I feel like you're, you're, you're you're splitting a hair that philosophically doesn't it's, split the two. Well, he had I'm to not. win World War II to make his other goals happen. Well, no, the, uh, let me re, let me let me repeat this. So, does he want to find magical artifacts because because they have magical powers that, that will enable him to to magically strike down the allies? Like, does he want to call down actual demons to do his bidding to fight on the battlefield for him? That's one consideration. The other is he doesn't believe any of that stuff, but he he understands the power it has psychologically, socially, as a, as a cultural force to rally his people. Those are two very different things. He might have believed in both. He might have believed in one and not the other. But they are different things. It's like, remember in boot camp when they used to tell us about uh, the Boxer Rebellion? Mm -hmm. And I forget, I think it was, uh, was was it Dan Daly or uh, whoever the hero of the Boxer Rebellion was? It was Dan Daly. Yeah, it was Dan Daly. He got like a Medal of Honor or and some other decorations for it. And it's good enough for me. And the story they told us in boot camp was about was that he he single handedly killed like these hundreds of Chinese it's, it's, rebels. It's in the painting, the the famous piece of art. Um. Um. So he like these Chinese rebels are trying to storm the embassy, and he's fighting them off, and he's killing them off by the hundreds. Mm-hmm. And they tell us that in boot camp. What they don't tell us in boot camp was that he had a rifle, and he was shooting them. And that the, <laughs> these were pe- these the the rebels were members of this this kung fu cult, and they had been ta- they had been taught that their chi made them bulletproof, mm-hmm. and they didn't need weapons. Just with the power of their 
of, of their own bodies and the chi they had developed through their Kung Fu training, they could get past armed Marines. And as it turned out, they weren't bulletproof. Um, they still had so, to shoot them all. That's tr- yeah, true. But, but my point is like, you know, clearly still- the, the belief in their chi was powerful in motivating them to all run like lemmings into bullets and you know i me if i saw the first couple hundred guys in front of me drop i i probably would have lost some confidence in my chi and not done that but, they just but i've never they been just, in a they just didn't cult. believe enough those, those ones didn't believe i believe right, right? Yeah. that's right but the, but my point is like did hitler really believe that his chi would enable would make him bulletproof and he could overcome the embassy or did he just believe in the story to motivate people to go do that on his behalf. That's the question. In all, I mean, in all so, fairness with Indiana Jones, it was never Hitler that's on the screen, right? It's always some weird scientist. So it's always some weird guy trying to get this right. in, the, in the new Indiana Jones is along the same lines again. But so, but my thing is, spoiler it, alert. It, it was Himmler that was out doing all this digging on his behalf. But why would he, if he didn't think it would provide him a tactical advantage, why would he dedicate such a large, such a, portion of his ss to go off and do these things like that's my thing like because I get if what western you're christian culture saw the ark of the covenant then they'd probably run right uh, back to my point he right. believed he had to have believed there was something tactical or strategic in the advantage else yeah, he man. wouldn't have spent time on it like that's I, whether or not he truly well, truly believed in it or thought it was a gimmick that he could use to win like if if the dude didn't see a means to furthering his military cause, he wouldn't have been spending cycles on it. Like, have have you ever seen the uh, the Dwayne Johnson version of Hercules? Yes. No. Is it? It kind of reminds me of that, right? Like he was just a dude, but he right. had such a legend about being right. so badass. His whole yeah. team did weird things behind the scenes. Yeah. And then everyone who came to fight him was like, ah, yeah. So that guy's a god. Yeah, Brian. The gimmick is Hercules doesn't believe he's the son of Zeus. He has zero belief. He just knows he's a badass, but his people kind of sort of believe, and he keeps telling them to stop furthering it. And every time he turns around, they're like whispering to people that this is the son of Zeus. And he's like, I told you to stop that. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, so this is, this is the rock version of yeah. Dune. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty good. Actually. Uh, it could have been, it could have been really good, but instead <clears throat> yeah. it's the rock and it became silly and it became a joke when, when it probably, it, had some good, mean, it had some good action sequences though. Yeah, yeah. But if, if they had like a Russell Crowe type gladiator vibe to it, it could have been an epic movie that won Academy Awards. But no, we we cast Dwayne Johnson. Yeah, because he was in every movie at that time. Right, yeah. Oh, you want to make money? Cast yeah. Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. <laughs> so, if they recasted it today, it would be uh freaking just a dude. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Mama. See, how many, yeah. see how many times I can flip my hair for this. Like, because the remake yeah. of Conan was really bad. Did you oh, see that, really Brian? Did. Yeah. Oh, you're, I, I was say angry. It was his fault. I said it was I, sucked. Yeah, I was angry about that. I liked the other one. The other Conan? The one before Momoa's. The Arnold Schwarzenegger, Conan the Barbarian. Oh, there was or one in between the two. Destroyer? No, oh, there was a Conan in between before that other one. Wasn't it Conan? No. I don't think so, man. And then, then mm-hmm. it was a Hercules. Maybe. I thought there was a Conan before the Maloa one. No, was... no idea what you're talking about. It must have been Hercules. Maybe it was. Hmm. I think Hercules came out after Conan, though. Yeah, there was a Hercules. It was uh, the main character, the legend of Hercules 2014. It was an unknown dude. Uh, who's the main actor? That kid from Twilight. No, it's not <laughs> the kid from Twilight. Yeah, there was a kid from Twilight who played Hercules. This is was... most certainly not the kid from Twilight. It's not but Taylor yeah. Lautner? No, because like kid. I said, it was 2014. Yeah, it was a kid from that's what, about when yeah, Twilight, Twilight was. Twilight was like in 2008. Yeah, after the kid was in Twilight, he was cast as Hercules. He wasn't like the main guy. He was one of the like supporting characters. So this is, you guys wear me out whenever you don't listen. 
I, th- I think he was, <laughs> what do you want me to listen he, to? He was he was just famous for being on a Taylor Swift album, so it's fine. Legend of Hercules. The main actor is Kellen Lutz. I don't know who that is. Didn't I kid. just say it's an unknown guy? Well, and then you Brian two said clowns it wasn't the... kept telling me it was the guy from freaking Twilight. First of He's... all, don't say you two clowns. It's only <laughs> one clown. Why are you angry? Not, right the, now? not, the, not the two. <laughs> and also, Brian did say that he wasn't the main dude. Oh, that he okay. was a, he was okay. a, he was Look a lesser up his IMDb. He was in all Twilight. Right. I was dating a girl who wanted to go see it because that guy from Twilight's in it. And we didn't go see it. And then we broke Maybe up. there's a dude named Lutz. And, and then Twilight. we broke up. <laughs> <laughs> Not because of that, but uh I think that's a good enough reason, uh, truthfully. Okay. okay, this guy was in Twilight. He wasn't the okay, he wasn't the main <laughs> actor. I see. All right. I accept yeah, your who's apology. clown now? Who's the clown now? I don't you kept I, saying the dude from Twilight, and I was like, wasn't the dude from Twilight? I said, Who is a, dude, Twilight? I said a dude from Twilight. Uh, clearly, what I said. clearly I've Play never watched I've never watched Twilight. Well, so Matt's wrong. It 100 percent I watched the very first one on DVD and I sat on the couch and I looked at Delani and I'm like, what the hell are we watching? Why are they still staring at each other? And then I never watched another one. I have the 4k (laughs) collection and I watch it every year. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) That's, that's how we're, that's how we're ending this episode. By the way, (laughs) thanks for listening to Mount Hermeneutics. We hope you enjoyed the show and maybe even took something away to think about. Be sure to send us feedback, both positive and negative. Like and subscribe on all the socials, and tell your friends. Until next time.